Uh, thank you very much, Timon, for, for introducing me, for inviting me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, actually, this is my first visit to Heidelberg. I've been to Karlsruhe a few times, a few other German cities in the surroundings, but never to, to Heidelberg. So it's a beautiful city. I'm happy to be here. Uh, what I'll talk about is a, uh, it's kind of an overview of the area of electricity price forecasting. Uh, and this will be focused actually on short-term forecasting because you can think of forecasting for the next few years or so. That's a different, different methods are applied in that area. Different data is used for that. I'll be focusing more on the on the short-term on the short-term forecast. So that's uh, that's something that uh, I would like to talk about. And of course, as uh, as is kind of usual these days, when you become a professor. You have an, like my colleague likes to say, you have an army of PhD students behind you, and the army is listed <laughs> listed here. So some of them are already graduates, uh, some of them are some collaborators and uh, working in different universities. So, uh, so it's been uh, not only my <laughs> my work I'll be talking about, but also about my co colleagues' work. Okay, let's go into the uh, details. So we can ask ourselves, what is the price of electricity? right now well or even in the next hour or so this data is for the for the load period uh, from 11 to, to 12 so actually right now uh the period this load period has started and what you see here is a curve of the uh of of the prices for today but it was so it's not really forecasting this is not forecasting what i have to say it's already given it's actually established day earlier so for those of you who are not into electricity trading this may be a bit strange or awkward but actually this is how it works the most common on the the most kind of used as a reference point uh is the day ahead market and it operates uh you bid in the morning and then you uh for the for the next day and you have all the prices for the next day so for today you we already know all the prices but actually what we'll be talking about we'll be trying to get this price more or less either as a point forecast or as a probabilistic forecast or maybe as a path forecast. So this, these are the ideas I will trying, I will be trying to convey uh, during today's talk. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this the structure can be very volatile even within the day. That's because of the way of the sources from which we generate electricity, and also our consumption patterns. So at night we usually do not consume too much. During the middle of the day, there's especially in the summer, there's a lot of solar generation. Uh, and this kind of two peak structure is is pretty common for days uh, where we have a lot of solar generation and countries where it actually has a significant contribution. Uh, so the, if you look at the literature on electricity price forecasting, it is mostly about the day ahead market. This is the, the orange part, this part. So you, we bid in the morning so today we still uh, we have bidding for today around noon a bit after noon we have uh, the settlement of all the prices for the all the load periods of the next day and most common structure is we have 24 prices for the next day so we are actually what you see on the previous curve these 24 prices they were sorry they were established yesterday around noon so this is the structure. However, this is not the only market there is. There are also short-term markets, and some of them operate in a completely different manner, more like the financial markets. Uh, for instance, the, what is here in blue is the a continuous uh, intraday market where you have continuous trading of a product. So you have a product. Let's say you have an hourly product. Uh, so this is the delivery during the hour one on day D. You start trading in the afternoon of, on day D minus one, and you have a continuous, like in like in a very short time before the actual delivery, but for a few minutes before delivery. Uh, you can have, and the, these are different contracts because delivery of electricity during a particular hour is not the same as in the delivery of the during the previous hour, or the next one, because the electricity cannot be stored easily. Uh, when you store it, you lose a lot of energy. So uh, typically, you would like to uh, produce electricity when it is needed, not when it's convenient to you. Mm. Okay, so what is actually behind the uh, the auction market is so so that this day ahead market, the, the orange one here, is that for every load period, and this typically is an hour, but this can be also shorter time intervals, like half an hour or quarter hour or even five minutes in some markets, 
uh, that you have you bid into the market. You uh, you you have a demand bid and supply bid, so you can aggregate them. So if you want to supply your your electricity to the market, you say that you supply this amount at this price. Uh, when you're buying it, you only say, okay, I'll buy this much at this at this price. So here's the. Mm, so when you aggregate all of these from the different participants of the market, you can construct the demand and the supply curves. So this is the uh, the supply curve, and this is the demand curve. So the more you demand, you're actually willing to pay a higher price. If you demand not too much, you 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 can you are asking for us. You you don't want to pay too much. Uh, so the intersection of these two curves, one is decreasing, the demand curve is decreasing, the supply curve is, is increasing. The intersection, this point here, gives you the price, and this is actually the price we have seen on the previous slide. So for every load period, for instance, every hour, we do this. So when we forecast, uh, we are forecasting the intersection of these two curves for every, over, uh, every load period. What is also important is that we do it at the same time, essentially using the same information. So it's not like a hourly time series where you have one uh, information about the about uh, let's say hour two, and then you can use it to, to predict hour three. It's just all of these prices, all of the twenty-four prices for the next day, are established at the same time. So it's more like work working with vectors of prices than with uh, kind of an hourly series of prices. Uh, okay, so we have. We have this is how the two basic markets operate. But of course, the world is not stable, and there are many things changing in the world. Uh, so, of course, in the last few years, we have seen a, a large uh, share of wind generation coming into the market with more and more wind firms established. And this may have the effect uh, of generating electricity when it's not really needed. Uh, so you may have periods like what you see here on this on this plot, taken from a, from my colleague's paper, from Lawrence's paper, uh, nicely illustrates when you can get, for instance, a negative price. So what you see here, uh, conventional generation meaning meaning let's say uh, coal-fired uh, generation. The purple one is the wind, and and the yellow is the solar. So of course, solar is during daytime when the sun shines and the night and the nice weather is. Uh, the the gray uh, the, the purple one is when you when you expect winds strong winds in the and in the next days and you see that the percentage can be can be uh, up to a, a, almost half a, on some days here and the given that this may be the consumption on a given day may not be up to the up to what is generated then the prices can drop and the and the black uh, the black curve with those little circles is the actual electricity price. So on some days when you don't need like you know, like Sunday night here, uh, you do not need so much generation. The sort of wind, uh, the prices can become negative. And what you see here on the right are the intersections of the supply and demand curves for these particular hours. So they, these, these curves kind of shift uh, depending on on the demand, uh, how much. Uh, uh, homeowners, how much the industry demands for, for electricity in a given in a given load period, and of course the supply also changes because of the changing conditions in the markets. So this the the brown part can be relatively easily manipulated. You can you can say you want to generate more or less. There are some exceptions. I'm talking about it later. Uh, whereas wind and solar, you take it uh, when it when the sun shines and when the wind blows. Uh, with the solar, there's something you may have heard. It's called a duck curve. A duck is plotted here so that you can see what this white duck. So you have a morning peak, and uh, during the day, there's a lot of sun generation. So, so there's no need for conventional power in, during this day. And from year to year, you see with more and more solar panels in the country, you see uh, that this dip in the middle of the day just goes, goes down. And this was the term. The duck curve was coined by the California system operator, uh, but you can see it in every market nowadays. Uh, so, so there's the, the problem is arising is that there's a big change of of uh, demand from conventional power uh, between the late afternoon hours, where it's still well the sun is slowly uh, setting, and there's still a lot of demand uh, in the evenings 
when you need electricity, but there's no source to generate it. So this is this kind of, this becomes a technical problem. Of course, this gives you this intraday variability of prices also. Uh, Okay, but the good news is that the academic empire strikes back, <laughs> meaning us. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, if you see the number of papers, I don't know if this is good actually, but, <laughs> but there's more and more, there are more and more papers. Uh, is it just because there are more papers in the world? And we had a pandemic and people didn't have much to do, so they stayed at home and, and wrote papers. Uh, but apparently, you can see in all areas of forecasting, the numbers of papers have increased. Uh, here you have the, the kind of kind of automatic classification among the, the solar wind price forecasting and load forecasting, but you see in all areas, this has increased. Uh, the solar probably has the most because a decade ago, not much, there was not much solar generation, so not many people were writing about it, but this is becoming more and more important, of course, uh, the world. So, so the area I'm interested in is this kind of this red niche area of price forecasting. Uh, well, why is it niche? My hypothesis is that uh, when you want to do price forecasting, uh, it may be good uh, that to know a bit of the economics behind it, not just the physical characteristics of, of production of electricity. Uh, so, so this is mostly how much is generated from solar power, how much from wind, and what is the, the load or the demand for electricity. So these are the things that are the more technical, that the, the engineers are spe have specialized in this for, for, for a number of years now. But this, this red part, part here is a... Uh, is a mix of engineering and 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 economics or financial uh, knowledge behind it. Uh, okay, so uh, during today's talk, I would like to review a few major uh, paths of research or show you a bit of the evolution of how how this has how this has progressed over the years. So first, let me start with the models. What kind of models we are looking at? Well, okay, to start with models, you need to understand what kind of data you have. So, of course, there are papers where people would look at this data as a univariate kind of series. So you have hourly granularity series, and you just have hour after hour, you have, you have your data. And you can, there are some papers where you build models, uh, where we build models just for this kind of time series. So you build just for the next hour uh, using the previous hour as, 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 as known, or you forecast it is, you forecast it to use it in the in, in, in predicting the next the next hour. So kind of a kind of a, a 24 step ahead forecast, you can think of it. Uh, a more common way is to look in a kind of a more multivariate setting where you have 24 series, uh, which which, as I've said before, uh, are established at the same time. So all these values here, this red one, the red dots, they are all established at the same time during the auctions. So it's more natural to have it to have it as a as a vector series. Uh, and this is a, either either writing a, building a separate model for each of those, perhaps using information from other other series, or trying to jointly estimate all all twenty four uh, prices at the same time. Uh, there's a nice approach, which is, we, have, we have not seen too many applications of it, but con the concept is nice, nice to use a functional data analysis. So you, you think of an evolution of a function, not of points on a curve. So, so your object is a function, which, which uh, is an approximation of the, of, those, of the curve I've shown you before. So, so you think of a dynamics of a function, not of points on some that, that constitute the curve. So there are a few papers in this area. Uh, there's even a very recent one, uh, just, just seen it, uh, where you actually try to, to use uh, functional approximation of this. And then of course you can discretize it to get the actual points on the curve. Um, but there's also a different way of looking at it, uh, kind of more fundamental one you can say. So you look at the supply and demand curves, and this can be done again, like in like in Florian's paper, where you kind of discrete, you model a, a set of points on a curve, but this is looking at the points and they are kind of linearly interpolated between within the points. So you construct one curve, the demand curve, the supply curve, and then the intersection intersection gives you the price. So there's, you can model the evolution of the curves, uh, or like in the paper of Francesco. You see, uh, there's, uh, you can think of it in a functional way. So you can have smooth functions. So the supply and demand 
And then, of course, the intersection gives you also the, the price. So this is not very popular approaches. There are very few papers on this, but actually the approach is interesting if you have knowledge about the fundamentals. Who is actually bidding? So how this curve moves because of some, I don't know, one generator is offline, another one is, is used or not. So, so you can you can actually construct the, this, this curve and uh, as, as my colleagues show here, it can be also a good a good forecasting method if you have this information to construct the curve. Okay, so those are the basic. So most of the papers are about uh, this approach, essentially, than the multivariate one. Uh, very few on this and a few on this, but I think they are interesting concepts. Um, okay, so what is the uh, the underlying model? The two, the probably the most common one starting already in the mid 1990s were autoregressive models uh, so you you think there is some dependence between the price on day let's say this is just separate every hour you can so this is just h here which represents the hour so it's just like taking just let's say the upper that's one row here only uh, so you say that the price on our uh, h on day d is a function of the past. So the, or the, the price for the same hour on the previous day, let's say two days, for instance, seven days. These are typically the most influential in terms of dependence. If you look at the dependence structure between day D and the previous days, th those three days are typically the most, the most influential ones. Uh, quite often, models include exogenous variables. So variables like demand, forecast or generation let's say wind generation forecast if such is available at the time you you bid into the market and these quite often are available the day before or sometimes two days before uh, and then sometimes you still need some kind of uh, seasonality correction this can be either to simple dummies which is the problem in the most common way it can be also to some smooth functions but uh, it's i think with, with seven days it doesn't make much sense to something put something much more complicated so this is a very simple autoregressive structure with the with exogenous variables, quite often noted in the literature as ARX, autoregressive, autoregressive with exogenous variables. Now, if you look at the literature on electricity price forecasting coming from, from authors with statistical background, this would be most, mostly regression models. Uh, but already in the 1990s, there were, of course, neural net models. And uh, what you see here, is uh, from a kind of a review article we wrote, more like a uh, popular science article, I would say, uh, on the evolution of, of the of the models, and you can represent a regression model as a as a neural net essentially without any hidden layers. So here, so every arrow represents some weight, some weight. So you take the input, uh, the price for the d minus one hour age times some weight or coefficient, like the bait on the previous slide. And you sum them up, and this gives you just uh, just the price. So the regression model is a very simple neural net without a hidden layer. When you include a hidden layer in, in here, you, you can have nonlinear dependence uh, in the structure. And the first neural nets that were used uh, were, were typically typically multilayer perceptrons. So there was no uh, backward links, but just a feed-forward architecture uh, with some in and they are the same here as in this example, uh, a hidden layer which would allow you for nonlinear dependency between the inputs and the output. So those are the, 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 the beginnings. Now, kind of the next major step uh, was the inclusion of, uh, well, they are called like the statistical learning or machine learning depending again from the you, 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 you're talking to. So a regularization uh, on, a, a, on an autoregressive type of, uh, or non-regression allows you to eliminate some of the variables which are not so relevant for the uh, for given task. So comp if you think about the regular reg regression model, you have, you minimize the residual sum of squares. So the, the model value minus the, the actual value difference squared and sum, sum, sum over it. So this is just the original sum of squares. But what the regularization model does, it, it, it adds a penalty uh, for the size of the coefficients, with the betas. Uh, so if you go back here, 
we have the betas here. So we have a we have some um, some constraint on this, not not really constraint, sorry, a penalty, and some coefficients. So with the at the cost of adding one more coefficient to your model, because you have to estimate lambda somehow, you can put into your model hundreds of variables. The largest models I've seen were around 26,000 variables, and Lasso still works. Uh, you, you put a lot of variables, and using this, this penalty, most of them are eliminated. Eliminating the science, beta is actually shrunk to zero. And last is that the name comes from this least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. So it allows you to shrink the coefficients, the betas, but eliminate some of them completely. So setting them to zero. Uh, what you see here in the plot, maybe I'll, I'll magnify just part of it, but uh, just, just let's look at, at one, try to still step between the lines still. Uh, so let's just take one of the variables that we have here. So this is some exogenous variable. It's, it's yesterday's load forecast for today. Uh, so the gray gray squares here represent whole vectors of prices, not like like here. Just there was the day and hour. Those are white squares. The, the gray one is just the whole day. Like here is the previous day, uh, two days ago, all twenty four uh, prices. So let's look at the yesterday's load forecast. And uh, what you can see, you can given let's say a particular hour, let's say hour eighteen, you can see. Uh, exposed, of course, you can see which variables are most often chosen in, the, in this model, in, the, in this setup. Uh, so what is something to be expected is that you see a diagonal. So the load forecast for a given hour is used in the model. So this is the diagonal. But maybe less obvious is that the load forecast for the morning hours are important for all morning hours, of day, daytime hours, essentially. And even more so is the late evening hours are also important for, for, for uh, the next day's, uh, so today's price actually. Uh, this at first, when we saw those results were a bit of a surprise. Uh, the, last, the last part of the day may have been due to this is the kind of the, the closest to the next day. So it, it, it should have some independence on the early morning hours, but we're surprised to see that it has actual dependence on not only the morning hours, but actually all the later hours. Uh, so what what it what it does this gives you information what is most often chosen which 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 variables are most often chosen so the green is the best the most often the black the dark gray is the, the least uh, and this can also allow you to build simpler simpler regression models with just these variables so maybe you take the, these three this one and this one and this will be a relatively good regression model okay so this was uh, this is uh, shrinkage and of course then in the let's say more machine learning world, you have, of course, uh, you can do a more complex neural nets. And one of the advantages I see is that, that neural nets relatively can easily cope with a, a many outputs. So you can output a whole vector of prices, whereas in the statistical world, you have this vector autoregressive models which potentially could do this, but I have not seen a paper where this would work well. And I've, we have also tried it. So it seems the structure is too complex for a relatively simple structure of a vector autoregressive model to relatively well represent all the hours at the same time in, within one, one model. But with neural nets, this, is, this, is, this works quite well. Now, of course, you can include more layers, so going deep, deeper structures. Uh, and we've tried to, typically we end up with two layers. That's if, if we do build our models, the more layers you have, the more parameters you have to estimate, the more data you should use it. Uh, so it's uh, typically two is, is enough. Uh, you may use some uh, uh, backward links to, to the information coming, kind of going back in, in the deep neural nets where the outputs are uh, all 24 hours of the day. So the kind of the, the biggest advantage I see when you compare a regression model to a to a, a neural net is that in a neural net, relatively good forecast can be obtained for uh, for whole vectors of prices. Mm. Okay, we might ask, what about performance? How do these compare? The, let's say the uh, the last way approach and the and the, this two layer, uh, two two hidden layer uh, deep neural net. Uh, in this paper, we compare it across five different markets, and as you can see here on this on this uh, plot, the uh, the green shape is the, are the errors for the 
for the deep neural net, the gray are for the for the uh, lasso estimated autoregressive model. In general, I mean, as you can see, it's, it is uh, across all four markets, it was better. Uh, not significantly better in terms of the statistical terms across all markets, but in general, it was, it was better. But we had to use a few runs because of the variability of the results you get because of the random initialization of the, of the, of the, of the random optimization in, in, in involved in the process. Uh, if you would like to play around with with these models, uh, uh, on GitHub we have a we have a toolbox with the data, with our models, and with the results from those models. So if you would like to compare this with your approaches, uh, just uh, uh, just try it. it. It's there. If you have any problems, contact us. And this gives you two well, relatively well performing models. So the last estimated one and the DNN, the deep neural net. Uh, and also the data sets you can easily compare the results, whether you are better or not than, than these models. These are still for point forecasts. I haven't touched, uh, we haven't used to hear uh, probabilistic ones yet. Uh, a different area of research, uh, with, well, so far we have one, uh, one paper on this, is interpretable neural nets. This is also some a lot of talk, talking about in the com computer science uh, community. Can we construct neural nets where we understand what the neural net is doing. Well, this is not really thought fully interpretable. It just gives, we can give interpretation to parts of the network. So actually when you, what you see here is, uh, so parts of the network can be, uh, you can assign information uh, that this part of the network, let's say, is responsible for forecasting the trend this one for seasonality, another one is, is for representing the exogenous variable, the impact of the exogenous variable on the final price. So, so there's a pretty complex structure how it is, but within this structure, you can identify parts of the network that do something. Of course, you don't understand exactly what is happening exactly in those blocks and uh, in the very small, uh, tiny parts of the network, but you have a kind of an overview of what the network does. The results, uh, the results in this uh, are comparable to the ones for the DNN model. Not much better, I mean, they are more or less the same, but you gain interpretability a bit at the cost of higher computation, a slightly higher computational cost. So there's a trade off. Uh, it still is not full interpretability, but it's in the, at least in this direction. Mm. Okay, this, the next topic. Okay, ever. Maybe I'll skip it. Oh, maybe, okay, no, maybe not. A quick, quick look. Uh, how do you select a calibration window? So when you estimate the model, you need to somehow select a window on which you train your data. And if you look at the literature, this ranges just from a few days up to a few years. So there's no consensus what it should be actually. Uh, we, uh, so we had an idea of, of com using combining forecasts, so forecast averaging, to uh, to do it, so we may train your model, whatever it is, is it the regression, is it the neural net, on different windows of different lengths, and just combine them, combine the forecast, even with equal weights, so even with just one over n, to to get a combined forecast. And this actually, this surprisingly works well. So here is uh, from one of the papers uh, we had. So on the x-axis, you see the length of the calibration window in days. So ranging from roughly one month to, to two years. Uh, these are the individual dots are the individual uh, forecasts of the model for a given calibration window length. Uh, this is for a neural net, a simple neural net, and this is for, for an autoregressive model. Uh, and of course, well, if you, first of all, you would not be able to, to predict that the optimal window length would be something like 66 days or whatever here, there's no way to do, do it. Uh, and But even a simple average across all windows is the yellow line is better than any single, uh, any single uh, calibration window. And if you choose a bit more smarter, let's say a few short-term windows and a few long-term windows, uh, you, you are much, much better than any of the individual models. This works better the simpler the model. In more complex models, you, you, you gain less with this approach. 
So uh, this is something we did at some point, but it's uh, just for simple models. You can also think about splitting your data into periods which are similar, so kind of identifying breakpoints in the data. This is an econometrics uh, literature, pretty common concept that you identify breakpoints and use only parts of the series to calibrate the model, parts which are similar in some sense. So for instance, here, you would like to forecast this point. So you find periods which are similar, this one, this one is similar, this one, and this one, let's say according to some to some classification and then you just train your model on the black forgetting the the gray that is also possible this also works but also generally helps simple models if you have more complex models it won't it won't give you much okay probabilistic this i guess <laughs> tillman was waiting for uh, so the problem here the main problem is that how do you compare a probabilistic forecast with a was the one observation you have. And of course there are scoring rules for that. Uh, and in general, what you, what you would like to do is you would like to get a pretty narrow distribution, uh, but some, a distribution that gives you the correct coverage across different uh, quantiles of, of, the, of the distribution. So that's the, the main idea here. Uh, the, pr uh, the pretty common measure to do it is the something which is called the pinball score, pinball loss. Uh, well, actually, there are many names for the, for the same. If you look at some literature, it's a linear, bilinear, newsboy loss, and so on. Uh, it's a measure, uh, if, you can, if you can see the plot here, for the median, it's kind of like a V letter. It tilts one side or the other side, depending on whether you are looking at the higher or the lower quantiles. Uh, so this is the penalty. So if this is, let's say, a low quantile, the penalty for exceeding this is relatively much higher than, than of uh, being on the on the right hand side of this, so within the interval. So this 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 score, if you average the, across all quantiles, is something which is called the CRPS, the continuous rank probability score. And uh, in most cases, when in the literature, when you see papers which report CRPS, they are actually reporting the pinball score across certain quantiles. Uh, so this is this is the, the measure. So using quantile regression, we had the idea of producing probabilistic forecasts by applying quantile regression to a set of a point forecasts. So, so kind of having in mind that, that uh, the industry has developed point forecasting models for a long, long time. Now, this gives a relatively simple way from going from point forecast to probabilistic forecast. So you apply quantile regression, which minimizes essentially the pinball function here for each for each for a given quantile and doing it let's say twice for the five and 95 percent uh, quantiles you get the 90 percent prediction interval so applic applying quantile regression gives you a relatively simple way from moving from point to probabilistic forecasts now of course you can improve on this uh okay, i'll skip this you can if the number of predictors is large you may want to reduce the dimensionality first so using for instance principal components to just get the factors a small number of factors instead of let's say 30 50 point forecast you reduce to two three four factors and then do quantum regression on them so this is one of the papers we've, we've, we've had uh, another approach is to use quantum regression with lasso penalty so remember the lasso penalty. This is just, just lambda times the sum of the of uh, betas. Uh, using this, it actually eliminates some of the regressors of the of this of this point forecast that you that you plug in here, and uses only the ones that are really relevant to give you uh, to give you the uh, the predictive uh, the, the the predictions of the quantiles. So this can also uh, improve the task. Uh, this is something that comes from the computer science literature, conformal prediction. Uh, the idea is, uh, I've seen only one paper in, 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 in uh, electricity price forecasting by, by Kat and, and, uh, and Seal. And the idea is that, of course, you split your, the, your data into the training and calibration data. And then on the calibration data, use the forecast of the method, of the method trained on the on the on the training set to predict to make out of sample predictions because on the part of your data randomly selected you don't you don't uh, you don't you don't use the data to to uh, estimate your model but just to compute the point predictions and then compute the you know to compute the non-conformity score so the differences the absolute differences between the actual values and your point predictions uh, and then 
uh, you construct, you find a, a threshold which uh, for a given confidence level uh, gives you uh, the right coverage more or less. And then your final prediction is, a, uh, is the point forecast plus minus this threshold, which actually gives already information that this will be a symmetric uh, prediction interval uh, with respect to the, uh, to the point forecast. Uh, what this method, how I mean, how it performs, it seems that it, seem, it, it seems to be better in the tails of the distribution. In general, the, the dashed lines, which represent the NCP, stands for the a variant of the of the conformal prediction method. So the dashed lines uh, for different different methods, point forecasting methods, generally curve more downward uh, in the tails of the distribution, get giving a better coverage in the tails than in the center of the distribution. The center. They're not, not extremely well, but in the tails, slightly better. It's not a huge improvement, but there is there is some improvement in the tails of the distribution. Uh, and this perhaps is the latest, uh, uh, I mean, what, what we have at least tried, my team or my colleagues, uh, we've tried to use distributional neural nets. So the idea here is to have as outputs not the prices, not the expected value of the price, the point forecast, not quantiles of the distribution, but parameters of a parametric distribution. In this plot here is just a simple uh, example with a, with a Gaussian where you have two parameters, the, the mu and the sigma, but of course you can have more parameters. You can have, you can have different, different uh, uh, more flexible, let's say, distributions. And when we, First tried it, I thought, oh, this is huge machinery just to get such forecasts. It won't, I mean, it won't be great. I mean, maybe it will be a bit little bit better, but I don't expect to be really working great. And uh, well, to my surprise, this, this really improves a lot. Uh, so here you have the results of the, um, of the uh, improvements. So you can see, first of all, the benchmarks here. So this is a lasso estimated model combined with a, some cure quite quantum regression uh, uh, averaging method uh, and the, 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 the lines and the um, crosses or the circles are either the individual runs, individual runs of this neural net. So we, we run it four times. The computation cost is significant here. So we, we run it four times uh, using different hyperparameters essentially, and you average them out in two ways. Uh, either like when you have when you have probabilistic forecasts and, and then you want to kind of combine them, two simple ways are uh, horizontally or, or vertically. So you either combine across quantiles or across probabilities. So they give you slightly different results, but in general, these are the individual ones, these are, these are the, the, uh, the combined ones. And you can see the improvement is really huge. I wasn't expecting this. This was, this was a surprise to me that it was so so substantial the improvement. So this is the CRPS. So this is the the essentially the pinball skull like, across ninety nine percentiles. Uh, as you can see, the two distributions we're looking at were the uh, the Gaussian and and Johnson's uh, SU distribution. The the second one has an asymmetric parameter and and some kurtosis. So. So it can have heavier tails. It can be asymmetric, as you see for some for our 18. For it, it fits better the data, and this is the results for the JSC distribution. This is for uh, for the normal one. So this is this was a surprise, although a bit expected that, that we may expect a better probabilistic forecast out of these models. But what even surprised me more is that you you also can get better point forecast. So this is the so these are the different models. Some of these models here, like these two, for instance, or well, actually these four, were trained. These are models that are trained to predict point, expected value of the future distribution. And they perform worse, the greener or the lower, the better, essentially. This is the mean absolute error. Uh, they, they perform worse than these deep neural nets, this distributional uh, neural nets. So this was a surprise for me, actually. Why, why, why that? Why is it happening here? At least with respect to the mean absolute error. Uh, whereas, well, the, to the, the squared error is uh, not as good here. So as you can see, there's there's some this one which is trained actually to produce point forecast it was better in this in this measure. And of course, in the CRPS, it is uh, it was better and was uh, and was uh, significantly better. Uh, okay. The still a few minutes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the final topic I want to 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 just discuss is uh, 
how to evaluate measures. So I've, I've, I mean, in the previous slide, I've shown you, okay, you have a point forecasting measure, like the mean absolute error, the square root mean squared error. Here's a probabilistic forecasting measure, so the CRPS. Now, is it enough? Uh, and more and more often in the, in the energy forecasting literature, uh, we are more concerned with the finance, some kind of a financial evaluation of, of your forecast than just the forecast themselves in, te in terms of some statistical measure. So, uh, so given some forecasts uh, uh, of, of a model, which are better, let's say, than a different than, than a benchmark, we try to build some kind of a trading strategy to utilize those forecasts. So in this example, in this paper, in this energy economics paper, uh, what, I mean, we take a we take a relatively simple strategy. Uh, so we we want to find you. We want to find uh, an hour where the price is relatively low, is, is expected to be low. So we the gray lines here are the prediction interval. In this case, eighty percent prediction intervals. So you want to find a, a prediction interval where the prices will be low, uh, an hour will be high, and in general, place a bit. To, to the to the to the in the day ahead market to buy it here, charge the battery and and, and sell it here, discharge the battery and, and sell it here. So this is this is the idea. Uh, we use linear programming to find the optimal moments to, to do it. Uh, but in general, the, the the concept is that we we look at the not at the uh, median price or the expected value, but at some quantile. In this case, the ten per, the ninety percent here, the ten percent. To give us some confidence that actually when we place a bit, because we are placing bits with these with these numbers, not not with the median, uh, they will be accepted even if we we are making an error. So with ninety percent probability, this this bit should be accepted for this hour, and this one should be accepted uh, for 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 this hour. So uh, and and of course we have to take into account the uh, the mechanics be behind it. So if we buy a megawatt roughly. We can sell roughly 80% of the megawatts because of the losses of charging and the charging and discharging cycle. Uh, and this, what is interesting, what we, we can see that these are just the different models that we check, but all of them are use uh, use the probabilistic uh, forecast uh, forecasts uh, compared to a point forecast based strategy where you get roughly let's say 37,000 over some period. Uh, we get uh, significantly higher significantly higher numbers. Uh, irrespective of what what range of of quantities we we select, so the width of the prediction interval, uh, uh, but as you can see here, it's it's roughly forty four thousand compared to roughly thirty eight thousand for for the point forecast based. So you just you make a point forecast, select the the hour with the lowest value, and select the hour with the highest value, and just trade at, at those two. Uh, if your bid is not accepted. Uh, in this case, we close it. This is for the Polish market. We close it in the balancing market. But for instance, in the German market, you could close it in the intraday market. So depending on what is what works in a given market, this 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 can be this can be applied. So nowadays, uh, energy forecasting papers try to incorporate such such strategies. The problem is that it is everyone is every strategy is very specific. I'm actually looking. My idea is to find some kind of a universal, relatively simple strategy. That could be applied in most cases, kind of like have a statistical error measure to have some kind of a strategy measure or economic evaluation measure to 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 be able to to uh, evaluate whether the forecast actually bring you some better, more information than than other um, than the forecast of another method. Okay, uh, yeah, this actually more or less concludes my talk. So I covered the. The three main topics plus the calibration window issue. Uh, and if any one of you is interested, of course, you can easily Google my name. That's my web page. Most of my publications are there. A links to codes also there. And uh, feel free to contact me if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you.